If you go to the Women's Club website and read about our history, one item that stands out is this statement. They purchased, planted, watered, and pruned street trees. I can just picture those early club members pulling wagons loaded with barrels of water up and down Palo Alto streets watering young trees. It's quite a legacy. We were reminded of that legacy when we lost the Coast Live Oak in front of the clubhouse in October. Today, we honor our oak with a talk on those amazing native trees. Here to share her considerable expertise is Elise Willis, Tree Programs Director at Canopy and a certified arborist. She will help us get to know our amazing native oaks. I'd like to welcome Elise Willis. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And um, let me just take one moment to share my screen with you all so that you can see the presentation. All right, hopefully uh, you all can see this all right. I see some nods, so that's great. So today we're gonna be getting to know our amazing native oaks. And many of you already know our native oaks quite well. You've lived among them and enjoyed them for many years. And so I hope that today I can uh, share something new with you. Um, and in many ways, I put a lot of my heart into this presentation because um, it's featuring artwork that I've created and many, many photos around Palo Alto that I've taken over the years that I've worked in this area. So welcome uh, to Remembering the Past, Observing the Present, and Our Hope for the Future. So as Sue introduced me, I just wanted to say again, my name is Elise Willis. I'm a certified arborist and I've been the tree programs director at Canopy um, for about a year now. And I was a program manager for several years before this. Um, I have my bachelor's in forest resources and conservation from the University of Florida. And, um, but my urban forestry focus has taken place right here in the mid peninsula. And um, this is, I came to know Palo Alto's trees quite well during this time. I was an urban forestry technician at the city of Palo Alto. And then while at Canopy, I managed programs such as the South Palo Alto Tree Initiative, the Great Oak Count and the Young Tree Care Survey. So for those of you who um, need a reminder or have never um, interacted with Canopy before, we're a nonprofit based here in Palo Alto. And our mission is to grow urban tree canopy in the mid peninsula communities for the benefit of all. And our vision, we envision a day when every resident of the mid peninsula can step outside to walk, play and thrive under the shade of healthy trees. This year, we celebrate 25 years as a nonprofit actually. And today we, uh, we began our work in Palo Alto, but today we work in five cities across two counties. Uh, we serve Palo Alto, East Palo Alto, Mountain View, Menlo Park, and North Fair Oaks, which span San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. And we have about uh, 12 staff and 13 teen urban foresters. And our, our work today focuses on tree planting and tree care, education for youth and adults, as well as advocacy. So there is a unique joy that comes from being able to identify and learn about uh, the organisms around us. And plants and trees, like this valley oak here, cease to be simply a green background and a new world comes to life when we can distinguish them. So I wanna just start by talking about the oak genus, Quercus. Um, just a, this is a crash course in a couple basics of, a, of uh, oak identification. Um, for those of you who are into uh, Latin uh, or, or any kind of root words, um, Quercus comes from the Celtic words quer and quez, meaning fine tree, and that they are. There are over 500 oak species worldwide, and you can tell them apart um, looking at their leaf arrangement. They are alternate, and you can see I've put a yellow box around alternate leaf arrangement. They have a simple leaf form, so they are uh, not compound like the photo on the left, and their fruit that they produce is acorns. 
I'm going to talk through a few native oak trees in particular to start us off and get us warmed up. Uh, first, the coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia, is its scientific name. This is an evergreen tree that grows relatively quickly and can reach 70 feet high uh, in 70 feet in height and spread. And although it's a true evergreen, its leaves persist only for one year and then fall off the tree when the new growth comes in in the spring. These are bushy, uh, dark green all year with um, these cool cuff, cupped little leaves. Um, most of these, all of these photos are from Palo Alto. You can see they can go, get quite large. They have these um, great gray trunks and they're pretty common in our area. Next is uh, the Valley Oak Quercus labata, which is considered by many to be the monarch of California oaks by virtue of its size, its age, and its beauty. The Valley Oak is a deciduous tree that loses its leaves in the winter and is considered protected species by the city of Palo Alto along with the Coast Live Oak that I just showed you. They have really amazing crooked limbs um, and these lobed leaves and the trunks are quite, um, quite blocky, uh, kind of like alligator hide when they're mature. Um, and they're just quite large and majestic. Uh, next is the blue oak, Quercus de glaciae. You may be less familiar with this one. Uh, it's especially suited to withstand hot temperatures. And this native oak typically is found growing in areas such as valleys and coastal ranges. And it's quite slow growing as well. Um, it's also deciduous like the valley oak. And it's, um, it's quite well known for its bluish tinted leaves, which is really lovely. And um, this is a less common oak in Palo Alto, but you will find it planted these days more often as street trees. And then finally, I wanna talk about the California black oak, Quercus kilogii. The black oak is highly drought tolerant and the most widely distributed of all the oaks in the West, growing in most areas throughout California. And this tree is deciduous as well and can grow um, quite large like the coast live oak. It has a really lovely rounded crown as well. And the acorns, in fact, uh, were preferred by Native Americans, by na many Native Americans and a common staple of their diet. You can see it has lobe leaves like the valley oak, but it's got, um, it's got pointy, the, you know, it's, it's pointy and it's not just smooth lobed. Um, and again, this one you're gonna find much less commonly and, um, but you'll find it as a, a newer street tree these days. And you can see one quite nice distinguishing characteristic is the very pretty reddish pinkish new foliage that comes out uh, when it's um, leafing out after winter. So um, one really amazing thing about oaks is that they are iconic. Um, there is a professor at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obisco, Obispo named Matt Ritter, who uh, said oaks are the most iconic and characteristic trees of California. Many people in my position take him at his word. Um, he knows a ton about our, our trees in California. Um, but in fact, oak woodlands make up 10% of the land area in our state here. And there are 21 that are native to California. 10 grow into trees and 11 grow into multi-stem shrubs more often. Um, these native trees, they range from barely knee high uh, to the largest in the world. Uh, the knee high would be like Canyon Live Oak and the largest in the world would be Valley Oak. Uh, and I will say they are, the native species are uh, restricted to Western uh, California, Southwest Oregon and Northern Baja California. Oaks are also well-adapted trees. They're well-adapted to the California environment of dry summers and periods of drought. They're able to thrive with less water than many other trees in the urban environment, in fact, and contribute to reduced need for irrigation when we plant them. And they're native. Um, and one really interesting thing I'll talk about more probably several times today is how they do not want any irrigation in the hot, dry summertime. Oaks are very critical um, for habitats and many other things. One oak tree can actually provide for thousands of organisms. You can see here um, the focal species on the right 
Uh, these were identified for, by the San Francisco Estuary Institute or SFEI in their reoking Silicon Valley report a few years ago. Um, these uh, birds and butterflies are, are very critical and I will reference SFEI's work several times today uh, because they are a really great organization. If you're not familiar with them, we've enjoyed partnering with them for the last few years. They've taught us a lot and um, they, just to tell you really quickly, they serve as this boundary organization where they take a lot of the really amazing research that's happening and they translate it into um, very practical management applications and recommendations for land managers. So they're taking really good science and turning it into really good practices. Um, so I'm going to reference their reoking uh, book a couple times and we'll make sure that anything I reference for the rest of this talk, we will share it with you after. Um, all the links. Um, so back to oaks being critical. Um, in our region, oaks in particular have played a key role in supporting local ecosystems and sustaining a diverse web of native wildlife. Um, and many of you probably already know this, but there's a shared evolutionary history that has produced very diverse flora and fauna that have uh, adapted to use and become dependent upon our native oaks. And it's worth mentioning too, that non-native wildlife benefit from oaks and native wildlife benefit from non-native oaks. Oaks are also dependable. They contribute to soil nutrient and hydrological cycling and form the base of a rich and varied food web, as I mentioned, largely through acorn production. Oak landscapes are known to increase biodiversity and ecological resilience. They improve critical urban forest functions by providing shade and storing carbon. They enhance the capacity of cities to adapt to a, climate, a changing climate. And they clean the air and beautify our surroundings. And oaks are historic. Uh, for millennia, California's Native Americans coexisted with oaks in the oak woodlands. Um, acorns were a stable food, a staple food crop. Uh, they used controlled fire to rejuvenate the land and manage it. Um, and oaks provided shelter. And there are many oak-centric place names throughout our state, like Oakland, Thousand Oaks, Oakley. Um, these and and probably more. Uh, really point to this historic influence of oaks um, for people for you know decades and centuries. And so um, here we are with our wonderful partners talking uh, to these partners in Palo Alto. And so I want to touch on Palo Alto's tree history, a brief version of it. So with the help of Palo Alto's urban forest master plan and some Googling, I'd like to touch on a few of our local uh, and recent history with trees. Um, so 1890 to 1920, we had a lot of the early tree plantings I put in here when the Women's Club was established, 1894, uh, when Gamble Garden was first established, 1902. Um, there's this wonderful quote from Trees of Palo Alto that says, from 1903 to 1916, the women of Palo Alto adopted the role of guardian angels to all trees, which I think is really wonderful. And then in the from the 1920s to 50s, um, we had a street tree system and park improvements all across the city. And then from the 50s to the 80s, uh, as many of you might know, lots of development happened in the area. And so there was also lots of critiquing of street tree systems we had and the parks we had. And so lots of good things came out of that time too. And so in 1982, there was a street tree management plan and a task force, gotta love task forces. And so uh, then we transition into the 1990s to 2010s where we were seeing um, in the 90s actually oak loss was observed. Lots of people were feeling like and seeing um, you know, lots of oak trees coming down across the city. And so um, decided that there should be a tree task force again. Um, and from this task force, came many recommendations, including having a tree ordinance that would protect oaks and redwoods, and even formed Canopy in 1996. Um, 
in 2013, uh, we got our first urban forester, um, who's uh, Walter Passmore. He's really great. And in 2015, the urban forest master plan was adopted, uh, which you can see a snapshot of the cover here. And um, this plan is really wonderful and uh, is a great source for diving into this history even deeper because I really just gave a super brief description. Um, but this plan has a really nice snapshot and, and history details. So um, going with this thread of history, um, so one of the first projects that Canopy took on when it was established was something called the Oakwell Survey. Uh, volunteers with Canopy conducted this Native Oak Survey 20 years ago-ish now, and it was one of those first projects where um, we had these oak loss observations from the 90s, and we had this new oak protection ordinance, but the, there wasn't a lot of hard data to go off of. And so by collecting information about the Native Oak population, they hope to be able to have more informed management decisions in the future. And so the purposes of this uh, program was to get a baseline for how many oaks of these native oaks we have, those four native oaks I talked about earlier, and to distribute native oak care tips to homeowners, um, which I thought was quite practical. And so, um, and here's a fun cup that says Oakwell uh, Survey Survivor 1997 to 2001. Uh, I'm sure, um, I know I got a kick out of that mug. So here's what they found from this in the survey. They surveyed 9,000 oak trees across Palo Alto, 13,000 if you count stands, clusters or groves um, of these oaks. It was predominantly coast live oak, um, followed by valley oak, and then less than 1% was blue and black oak, interestingly. It, that raised a lot of questions about, you know, are these even native? So, um, some interesting facts about it, over 50% of the oaks in the survey were on single family residence properties. Um, and then you can see in this map on the left, more oaks are occurring in North Palo Alto and as you go farther from the bay, which we there are many conclusions and, and things you can point to that might cause that. One of which is just soil and climate as you go farther into the, close to the foothills. Um, you're gonna have more of these oaks most likely, but there are some factors related to um, development history and things like this that play a role too. Um, and they found, you know, 13% of the parcels had at least one oak on them. And um, it was less common to find those really large oaks greater than 40 inches in diameter. Um, however, they found the largest tree in the survey was an 80 inch diameter uh, coast life oak, which is pretty amazing. But the reality is, despite the tree ordinance protections and a history filled with love for trees, oaks do not make up a significant part of our urban tree canopy cover. On the left is a clip from the master plan with street tree data from 2015. Um, you can see a couple of highlighted ones, trees species are these natives and less than 3% of the total street tree population was, these, was coast live oak and valley oak. Um, we know that these tend to be larger trees and are therefore well suited for private property um, rather than a narrow planting strip. However, there is a need for well adapted street tree population as well. So having oaks incorporated in this is something that um, we would want to have. And then on the right, you can see uh, in the photo from 1941, uh, the black and white one on the bottom left, uh, many trees were cleared to develop the area. And uh, this was a common practice then and continues to be quite popular today, meaning we lost most of the mature trees that were here then, unless they were, a few were intentionally preserved. Um, and for a long time, the trees we've removed have been replanted more often with things other than native oaks. So, um, SFEI's re-oaking report that I mentioned earlier made it clear that over the last two centuries, once prevalent oak woodlands have been largely eliminated, first through agricultural conversion and later by rapid development and urbanization. So the indigenous Californians lived in land of the oaks for thousands of years, harvesting acorns and introducing fires that significantly shaped the valley. Um, by the early 1900s, we became the Valley of Hearts Delight, 
uh, where people converted the land to highly productive agriculture and orchards. And then within a hundred years, we became Silicon Valley, a patchwork of urban trees and developed areas. This graph comes from uh, SFEI. We hear the term landscape resilience a lot, but what does that actually mean? Well, landscape resilience is defined as the ability of a landscape to sustain desired ecological functions, robust native biodiversity, and critical landscape processes over time and under changing conditions and despite multiple stressors and uncertainties. So in Silicon Valley circa 1850, this landscape was great for wildlife, but didn't stand a chance when it came to stressors and changing conditions brought on by urbanization. And you can see uh, in green, the majority of this pie chart is showing native oaks. And then you have some other um, cherries and, or, you know, madrones and all kinds of stuff in here, lots of natives. In Silicon Valley today, this landscape is pretty resilient for people, but not as much for wildlife, and in some ways is ecologically less sustainable. So you can see here, this is a rainbow now in this pie chart, and you can see um, native oaks are making up 4% of this chart today with, uh, with, let's see, London Plain and Southern Magnolia and Liquid Amber making up um, large swaths of it, which I'm sure uh, many of you are very familiar with these trees. So the last wave of urban tree plantings 50 to 75 years ago is nearing the end of its lifespan in some, in some of these species. And we now have the chance to shape our environment once again. Today, there is increasing recognition that reintegrating oaks in our parks and in our urban landscapes promises a host of benefits. So in some areas, the current tree canopy cover is already comparable to historic oak woodlands. So surely it's not going to be all about planting a million more trees everywhere. Rather than a massive rush to increase tree numbers everywhere, we consider what it would mean to shift which tree species we choose to plant and protect. So here we have um, it, an oak, a coast live oak. I took this photo uh, back on a beautiful spring day in 2017. Um, Gamble Garden folks, I, I hope you enjoy this. I, I loved visiting this spot and I um, I know many for many years Canopy joined the uh, Gamble Garden Spring Tour with a table under this area. It looked like this four months later. And I promise you, I didn't collaborate with anyone to get this. I happened to be there and stop by. I put some of my measuring tapes and things on the stump here. Um, for size reference, and I was very sad. And it is a sad story, uh, but not an uncommon one. Uh, losing a mature oak, as many of you know, can be a troubling ordeal. You get worried when you see it not looking well, or it drops a limb all of a sudden. You hire a certified arborist to assess it. The expert tells you this and that is wrong with it. Uh, you say your goodbyes and a shed a tear at the loss of a beautiful organism. And then you shed a tear for the few thousand dollars you're about to spend to get it removed. And then the spot maybe sits empty while you figure out what to do with the open area. And many times people don't replant an oak in that spot. And either the spot stays empty or becomes a different smaller tree or becomes the sunny patch for your, your sun-loving native plants or that tomato plant you always wanted. And here, I would be remiss if I didn't point out again, the Women's Club uh, Coast Live Oak that was removed. Um, this is just it on street view and I put a little box around it for you to see and appreciate one more time. Um, this tree is another beloved native oak also removed recently. There were some wounds on the trunk that had led to fungus and internal decay. And the city determined after several years of observation that it was finally time to remove and replace it. 
um, citing need for risk reduction mostly. And fortunately, the city plans to replant in the same location with the same uh, native species. Okay, one more. I took this photo on November 10th, 2015. It's a Palo Alto newspaper story that created quite a kerfuffle. Um, I was working at the Palo Alto Development Center when this went, this house, uh, this property went on the market. It's a half-sized lot with a giant protected oak that would potentially make or break the decision to purchase the lot. I watched Dave Doctor, the planning arborist at the time, field uh, a constant stream of real estate agents and prospective buyers all day long, attempting to answer this, uh, this common question, if we bought the property, how close could we build a new house to the oak? Or even outright, could this oak be removed to build a new house? So today, I will tell you, a new house stands and this legacy tree does still remain. And it's all the way in the back here. I've used this um, photo in so many presentations up to this point. So glad I took this picture of this crazy situation. Only in Palo Alto, right? So for the next half of my presentation, I would like to talk about our hope for the future, um, which we, you know, with hundreds of years behind us, we move forward to a new age of oak friendly practices and oak advocates, hopefully. And for, um, so here we're going to talk next about preserving oaks and retaining them where possible, planting oak trees, passing on your oak appreciation, and joining local efforts for trees. So what are the Gamble Garden Oak, the Woman's Club Oak, and other infamous tree examples meant to illustrate today? Large trees provide the large benefits that we need. We must protect our large trees when possible. They're relatively rare and particularly important. The benefits of large trees can't be overstated because we know that large growing and long lived trees pay us back economically, socially, and environmentally. So I want to talk about a little bit about appropriate protections for these trees, what development review plays in this, and proper oak tree care. So for appropriate protections, the city of Palo Alto's tree ordinance currently protects valley oaks and coast live oaks greater than 11 and a half inches in diameter and redwoods greater than 18 inches in diameter. Meaning removal and significant pruning requires a city permit on all property types and removal permits are only granted if you provide the necessary documentation and justification by the city code. There are, have been several plans over the years that have given direction for tree management across the city. And in particular, the tree technical manual here has given guidance for tree protection and mitigation during development. And uh, the urban forest master plan guides us forward today with lots of other, lots of meaningful goals. And so, um, I'll talk a little bit more about um, plans and things later, but this is the gist. Um, and so for development review, preservation of this particular very old Valley Oak in the Southgate neighborhood was prioritized when construction was planned for the house next to it. Early plan review among all stakeholders is usually key to make sure a tree protection zone is designated, installed and enforced. Um, so oftentimes the, the city and stakeholders have a, key, a role to play in development review to protect trees. It's worth noting that some oaks endure less ideal environments when people don't go through the proper, proper channels to get approval for things, or perhaps construction took place before the ordinance was even established in 1996. So remediation can be taken to free the trees from this wall, but it can be costly. So it's better to construct with trees in mind from the beginning. And so I'm gonna spend a few slides talking about proper oak tree care, which is really important. And some of these things will be reminders um, and some of these things will be new, hopefully. 
So um, I will share after this um, information on our website. You can see here, this is a little snapshot from Canopy's website that has lots of resources on tree care. Um, and so in general, we want to remember that the area within 10 feet of the trunk of a native oak should remain undisturbed and clear of most ve vegetation as much as possible, especially when it's mature. So competing plants like lawns and ivy, uh, these can trap moisture around the root crown and right at the base of the tree and creates the perfect environment for fungus. And so we're going to dive into each of these points more thoroughly about removing competing lawn and plants, watering properly, which I already said, no summer watering. I'm just going to keep saying it. Natural fertilization, leaving the leaves and twigs when they fall, pruning, and having inspections done when needed. So what you're going to want to do is direct water directly to the root zone. So water close to the trunk when the tree is young and then as the tree grows and its drip line, its canopy expands, you're going to want to extend your watering area out all the way out to the drip line as, as far as possible basically um, to reach where roots are growing. So mature native oaks, as I've said, do not tolerate irrigation in the summer the dry summer months. So ideally no irrigation would be applied during this time to the area from the base of the trunk all the way out to the drip line, no water. If irrigation is applied near the trunk during the dry season, the oak root fungus or malaria can grow due to the combination of warmth and moisture. So we don't want to water there. Um, we don't water to we don't want water to collect there around the root flare and the root, the root zone, root crown, whatever you want to call it, that whole area right at the base of the tree. Um, so because you don't uh, want that issue to arise and you also want to make sure sprinklers aren't spraying your tree trunks. Um, and so um, here's a couple of photos of widening out the area, but um, you know, these are smaller trees here where you can see that the root zone is quite small. So you're going to water quite close to the tree trunk. We've got lots of resources on our website with watering guidelines and um, our tree library. Save Our Water and Our Trees was put together back when we were in the drought. And so there's lots of interesting resources there for water conservation. A big one is mulch. Use natural mulch, such as arborist wood chips. These work great. Mulch is a powerhouse for increasing water retention and preventing runoff. It adds nutrients to the soil, it insulates roots from intense heat and cold, and it even mitigates soil compaction. So apply mulch out to the drip line and enlarge it as the tree's drip line expands, similar to with watering. And many settings uh, with lawns can be slowly converted to mulch when new trees are installed. You can see here we planted trees in a lawn in front of Coverly, and several of these are oaks. And so we're going to hopefully be able to expand these mulched, unwatered areas and convert it. And this is kind of a nice practice to try out in more areas, I think. And so um, you do want to ensure that the soil, soil and mulch don't build up on the trunk. Um, and cover up the root flare. Um, but uh, another key thing, like I said, is um, you know removing any lawn, removing plants, particularly like ivy, really water loving plants. Um, and river rocks are a big one. I see a lot of the big chunky stony river rocks piled up around trees and these are gonna absorb um, heat from the sun and radiate it directly onto the sensitive uh, water absorbing roots. And so if we can remove those and replace with arborist wood chips, any, I think trees would love it and they would do so much better for it. And it's also worth noting when you mulch the area and you allow leaves and twigs and things to fall and remain on the ground, it looks a lot more natural because you've already got wood chips there. And it's free fertilizer. It's nutrient cycling at its finest because you have the leaves falling out of the crown, falling into, into the soil, and it's just a constant cycle. There um, is also a, a key point, which is any necessary pruning should be performed by an ISA certified arborist, usually during 
uh, the winter dormant period for deciduous species and during July and August for evergreen species. Um, and according to the California Oaks Foundation, which is another great resource, um, they often say, they've said on their website too, when an oak tree shows yellowing leaves, one thinks it lacks nutrients, but generally this isn't the case. More likely the tree's suffering from root, root or crown fungus. Um, so you wanna contact an ISA certified arborist for an inspection, and they should be consulted if you see any signs of decay in the wood, clusters of mushrooms growing from the tree or next to the tree, anything like this. And Canopy's website has an arborist list where you can filter this down by what services you're looking for. And there's currently 50 companies in the area that have ISA certified arborists on staff. I have two slides that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, even though they have a, the most text of any slide in this presentation. Um, it's a note about pests and pathogens, uh, cause arborists get, uh, you know, originally were tree surgeons and tree doctors. And so this is a big area of concern is trees um, having issues with pests and disease. And so I just wanna say that I, I took a lot of this information from uh, the we uh, Western Arborist Magazine, very recent issue. And um, while California's native oaks do host a lot of pests and pathogens, only a handful cause serious damage or could kill an oak outright. Generally, these are secondary or opportunistic species that attack trees that are already weakened because of some environmental factor or something that people have done. And so in general, I've broken up here, the blue highlighted section is naturally occurring stuff that's hard to control. Um, uh, oaks suffering, um, by because of severe drought, fire damage, flooding, and repeated defoliation by insect and leaf stuff. Um, but then the bottom section is generally avoidable stuff. Management errors that um, the, the green section, these are management errors that create soil conditions that impair root growth and function and can create the perfect environment for pathogens. Um, this includes um, excessive pruning, poor site selection, um, like if it's too shady, uh, soil compaction, excessive irrigation, poor planting technique, and lack of appropriate mulching. So again, another, uh, another plug for mulch. Um, so the pests and diseases above and below ground can work together uh, to overwhelm stress trees and contribute to their eventual demise. So I'm not gonna go through this slide, but um, I will share the information afterwards. It's a few common pathogens, insect pests, and introduced invasive pests. Um, the next tip we have is planting oak trees. And I'll wrap up here in just a couple minutes um, so that we can get to your questions. Uh, we have resources. Uh, you can reach out to the city about uh, requesting uh, street trees and things, or if you have questions about regulated trees, so protected and street trees. And then you can re actually request um, an oak tree from Canopy if you live in South Palo Alto. We have a whole program devoted to that um, that you can find on our website as well. Reoaking um, is an approach developed by SFEI to reintegrate oaks and other associated native trees and vegetation um, into our California landscapes. And so we do have a rare opportunity to shape the aesthetic character, the sense of place, human health, and biodiversity for the next century. So we can do this by planting oaks and, uh, and incorporating lots of natives and things that many people are already doing. Um, one more, a couple more things, passing on your oak appreciation. Um, you can get nerdy with it by collecting acorns like uh, one of our devoted volunteers, Christine has done in this uh, photo on the left. You can go out and enjoy um, time in nature with your loved ones or friends. Um, I put a picture of my forest bathing book. It's really great for your health to go out and enjoy trees. And so um, I wanna do a plug that Canopy has tree walks on our website for all across Palo Alto and some of the surrounding cities and uh, even self-guided tree tours. And then there is also a wonderful one for Gamble Garden that was developed as a partnership and was even translated into Mandarin. You can remove weeds and mulch and uh, put native plants around your oaks. You can check out art installations and programs about oaks to deepen your knowledge. We did this great um, partnership with Ann McMillan and the Art Center last spring. Um, putting together this cool oaks booklet. And I like to just say, have fun with it. This, um, this is Groot. 
if you don't know, a Marvel Universe character in a bunch of movies. And um, finally, our recommendation is to join local efforts for trees, um, volunteer for the Great Oak Count, uh, stay informed of local policy changes. Uh, for instance, there is a new tree and landscape technical manual and ordinance coming soon. And uh, we recommend acting on our oak care tips. And so just a couple things is that the Great Oak Count we've been working on since 2017 to update our, our oak um, our oak data. And so we host trainings to help you ID the trees and record the data in our online tree map. And um, it's really fun. And we even brought back the uh, putting door hangers with oak care tips for folks houses where we survey the oaks. And if you want to get involved with that, you can email greatoakcount at gmail.com. Um, you discover lots of fun and interesting things along the way, uh, lots of cool galls and um, photo ops and big trees. And, um, you know, keep, keep informed, keep involved, keep staying up to date. Um, this is a, a really cool tree at a really cute house in College Terrace that I found when doing the Great Oak Count. And um, you get these really great moments and you get to appreciate that, you know, when we, when we preserve our trees and we keep up to date with what's happening to them, we can um, be more likely to keep these great images around. So with that, I will leave you with this quote and say thank you. And um, now we can transition in just a moment over to questions. Well, thank you, Elise. I learned so much and what a great topic. It has so many dimensions and I think we all learned a lot. Um, so I just wanna make the point for anyone who tuned in late and we did have a little bit of technical trouble as per always, um, the entire program has been recorded and will be available at gamblegarden.org in about one week's time. Um, and I just wanted to say that I thought it was so interesting to hear that early on in 1850, um, it was the valley oak, the Quercus lobata that was by far the most predominant tree of all in our area and, and definitely outshone both the coast live oak and the black oak by you know about 200%. So that's pretty interesting to, to see the transition of even types of oaks. Um, and so let's, let's talk about some of the great questions that we got and you could still put one in. I don't know if we'll, we'll have time to get through them all. But speaking of the valley oak, one of our viewers unfortunately lost a number of valley oaks in the CZU lightning fire. And her question is um, whether or not you could point her in the right direction on some local glower, growers of oaks, native oaks, that might have some well-established specimens. And I guess I would ask a second follow-up question to that would you recommend putting a well-established oak in place of an old large oak or would it be better to start with a small oak and let it grow? Mm, that's, that's a great, those are both great questions. So um, I don't get a cut of the profits for people I, or nurseries I recommend, but I'll just list a couple. Um, so there's several throughout the state, right? And um, we actually recently got some trees through a, the Stanford um, Home Forest Advantage program that they had here this season. I don't know if some, any of you are familiar with that. We got some oaks and they were great quality down from some nurseries in Sacramento. Um, but some local ones we tend to source from um, include Devil Mountain. And um, let's see, uh, we sometimes source trees from summer winds. We don't tend to source a lot of our oaks from there because we get wholesale, but um, there are also, uh, there are several. I should probably maybe look this look into my notes about where we source more of our trees and get back to you. But this brings me to the next question. Normally, this, so normally what we, we plant is 15 gallon size or the number 15 pot. Um, because oftentimes in an urban environment, 
where we're planting, you want something that isn't too big and too established, but you want to be big enough to have an impact and to not get like run over by something. And so um, in depending on what your property is like, you could um, go smaller, uh, go with seedlings from a native, uh, a local nursery that's getting natives. Actually, another nonprofit that we work with a lot, Grassroots Ecology, who has does lots of stuff in Palo Alto, has a nursery where they grow um, grow seeds from specific areas, and so they may have some for you. And you could definitely start smaller um, in that case. But we don't recommend. We we do occasionally plant twenty four inch boxes, and and lots of lots of larger developments do boxed trees to get a bigger tree from the get go. But the science actually supports that if you compare a fifteen gallon to a twenty four inch box, uh, and the twenty four is bigger. Um, you might get a bigger tree upon planting, but then within a few years of growth, the 15 gallon surpasses it much faster. Okay, very interesting. Um, we have several people wanting practical information and I'll try to call through here and get all these things so quickly, lightning round. Um, slime flux, um, is it something that will cause danger to the oak and is there a treatment? Um, that's a great question. I don't know very much about slime flux though, I'm sorry, but um, there are some resources online, particularly the University of California has some really great um, pest and disease stuff, especially um, they have some really great resources where um, UC IPM, Integrated Pest Management, has websites where as long as you know, if you know the species of tree that you're having an issue with, you can actually look up common pests and pathogens for that tree. And that really narrows down the list of potential issues. And I will say very quickly that one of the things um, on the pests and disease slide I had, I didn't say, is that um, the things you can do really as if you have like oaks on your property, let's say, is to observe them and make note of changes that you see that are persisting over a couple of seasons or any sudden changes like on the trunk with bleeding or the crown with browning and have it inspected by a professional um, because an arborist needs to do a complete diagnosis and consider all of the different factors that could play into it because um, disease symptoms can exhibit similarities to one another really easily. And so, and even you might think something's a disease, but it's an environmental stress or the other way around. And so um, I definitely recommend finding a professional potentially through our canopy arborist list to get that diagnosed. Oh, great. I'm glad you have that resource. Um, so a couple, technical things about planting a new, you know, planting a new oak, since many of us may be inspired to do that after today's talk. Um, would you water, um, summer water for a young newly planted oak? And would it be okay to use cardboard as a way to keep weeds down around the oak? Yeah, um, so you do want to, water the oaks when you're establishing them. So the first at least one to two years, you will do summer watering. And depending on the size of the tree that you plant, um, you would adjust how much water and how often you water. For instance, when we plant 15 gallon, we recommend um, 15 gallons a week for the at least the first six months to a year, um, unless it rains a bunch and then you don't have to do it that week. And then um, our watering guidelines show it tapering off as time goes on. And then once it's three to five years out, you probably don't need to, once it's established and you shake, shake the trunk and it's not moving anywhere and it's starting to put new branches out, you know that the roots are established and the it's now putting growth into the branches. And so you can um, start cutting back on that, particularly in the summer. And you had a second question, I already forgot. Oh, the cardboard, using cardboard to- keep Yes, the... sheet mulching is great. You can, if you have a major issue with weed suppression, um, you can do, you can pull weeds, lay down cardboard and then put mulch on top of that. And then that'll really suppress it and break down over time. And you wanna try to, um, can it be, uh, we, we have lots of, um, there actually I was saying Palo Alto in the summertime, the city has free chips at Mitchell Park over by the baseball fields. And in the wintertime, they transitioned that to sandbags. 
or at least that they've been doing that for a while. Hopefully they'll continue doing that so you can get free wood chips that way. Or you could even go in on a wood chip drop with your neighborhood or with your neighbor um, and call up a company and they'll come and drop it on your driveway and you can shovel it between you guys. Oh, cool. Um, so here's a really interesting one that may not be so urban oriented, but can you speak to oaks in pasture being grazed by cattle? Is soil compaction threatening enough to fence the drip line to keep cattle off the soil around the base of the trees? Yes, in different environments, you have to protect the young trees differently. Um, and so I think if the person asking this question has property that has cattle grazing, um, you pretty much just have to, there are, um, there are different things you can try out with fencing and, and safeguarding the, the trees, especially when they're young. Um, there are, if you go up to the Stanford dish, you can see lots of examples of this where really young saplings are given these tubex tubes to grow up in. And then as they get bigger, they get bigger fences around them. Um, and so it's kind of an iterative process. And if you have rangeland, you could even contact someone from the county or some uh, extension agency to specifically come out and look at your property because they can um, help you to come up with solutions and um, with good, with, um, with proper man properly managed grazing, compaction probably wouldn't be an issue. Um, but uh, you know, you would you would have to do moving them around appropriately and all that good stuff. Yeah, it's it's a big topic, but thank you for that question. So um, you know, we don't have time for um, a whole lot more, but could you speak about native oaks lifespan and kind of toward the end of their life? somebody was interested in lifespan and somebody else was interested in the propensity of live oaks dropping large heavy limbs and is that a strategy that is natural to them and but is something that we can do to reduce the risk of if you're interested there's a resource called the western tree failure database um, that actually has information on um, tree limb drop and other tree larger tree failures um, by species you can actually if you're just interested in data it has some interesting data and actual species profiles like eucalyptus hat various eucalyptus and oaks have these profiles where you can read all about that um, and then i think that um yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, great. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big topic, isn't it? So I think we are out of time, but I want to let everyone know before we go to our final um, concluding remarks by Sue, that um, we will be saving this recording. It'll be on the Gamble Garden website and perhaps other places. Um, Elise, I'm sure, will provide us with all of her resources, as she mentioned, as well as the slide deck we could get. And I can even copy and save these chat, the chat because actually a lot of people had questions about mulch and how to get mulch. And a lot of people had answers on where to get the mulch. So uh, you still have four more minutes. If you have something interesting that you want to go in the chat and will be saved, please put that in right now. Um, and uh, yes, uh, it's been fascinating. We weren't able to get to all the questions, but Elise, thank you. And I'd like to ask Sue to come back on just for a few more minutes and wrap us up. So Elise, I have to say that I'm looking forward to planting now a 15 gallon coast live oak right in front of the women's club. Yeah. And uh, I'm hoping that when you're off to Florida for an advanced degree that you'll give us your uh, your information so that we can stay in touch with you. We're very excited about this program and how this went today. I want to let everybody know other resources as well on the Gamble website. Um, Canopy and Gamble uh, cooperated on a, a tree tour and you can go on the website under the resources section. And frankly, you can do this with your phone. It's absolutely fantastic. And you can walk around the garden and you can, it guides you along. It gives you information. You can stand and look at these magnificent trees and really enjoy an extension of what Elise has talked about us about to us today. So thank you again, Elise. Thank you to Gamble Garden. 
and to Women's Club for sponsoring this with Canopy, who we just are so indebted to for this amazing information. I'm sure everybody will uh, go to that website very soon. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. And uh, we hope to bring you more programming in the future. Good night.